So I just wanted to really talk about how you view the impact of iron deficiency starting on more of a population level. With respect to impacts, my story was that initially I tried then to bring the focus to the non-pregnant woman and she was suffering from this issue of heavy menstrual bleeding that was affecting her on the days that she was bleeding to the point that she might not show up at work or if she did show up at work, her function was impaired. But then we realized that what she was experiencing every day were the symptoms of iron deficiency. And as we learned that iron deficiency anemia uh, is the extreme end of the iron deficiency spectrum. And indeed, cognition is compromised, physical function is compromised even before anemia occurs. So there was this sort of normalization of this process in women. They accepted that that was their lot in life. The next outcome has to do with pregnancy itself. And we learned that those women who are iron deficient become pregnant. And the, the impacts include preterm labor, uh, growth restriction, uh, peripartum hemorrhage. So that's another set of outcomes to try to improve these obstetrical outcomes. And then we learn about the fetus and particularly about neurodevelopment. So this fetus in utero needs iron to build things, build muscle, not just skeletal muscle, but muscle, heart muscle, for example, and brain. And so the fetus directs its iron towards heme. And when it's slightly deficient or deficient, it takes it away from the development of brain heart, skeletal muscle. And the outcomes are not just fixed by giving these kids iron later on, because it's almost like you're starting the foundation for a house and framing it. Um, and if it doesn't get started right in the periconceptual time, it's potentially permanently altered downstream. And so we have evidence of increased neurodevelopmental issues associated with autism spectrum, intellectual disability, uh, schizophrenia, ADD, ADHD, and this has been witnessed all the way up to the age of 30, which means it's forever. Uh, so those are the sets of outcomes that we want to impact. The quality of life for the women prior to pregnancy, the quality of pregnancy and the adverse outcomes there, and the brain, particularly, of the baby. And it's not just the baby, the baby who becomes an adult. but for both the fetus and the human, available iron is prioritized to heme. And when there's a deficiency in available iron, it's taken away from other either developmental or functional processes. So in the adult, it's taken away from brain function, from heart function, from muscle function. And it looks like functional capacity can be to a certain extent improved by giving them iron. In the baby, we're now talking about brain development, heart development, muscle development. So people need to understand that, that it's heme that it gets focused to and these other functional areas or developmental areas are what suffer when iron deficiency is present. Would it be fair to kind of put together that this loss of quality of life, functionality in the adult and the potential neurodevelopmental outcomes in the newborn, the fetus, reflect that early shunting of, of available iron towards heme and away from these secondary sources. And it's only when those have already been impacted do you see heme then be affected as a late casualty. That, that's, that's the feeling as to how this works. So anemia, it's really a manifestation, a late manifestation of a disorder called iron deficiency. Um, I think that's the way to think about it. So why aren't we mismeasuring ferritin or TSAT, right? And that's, I believe that's where we need to go. Hemoglobin is no substitute for the assessment of iron deficiency. So in relatively high resource countries, um, I see no reason why they shouldn't be starting off with measuring ferrets, starting at menarche, and all women planning pregnancy should have a ferritin done 
as well as, you know, their glucose screens and to have their iron deficiency corrected before they conceive. And with far more assisted reproductive technologies now, planning pregnancy is even more common than it used to be. So there's a greater opportunity. So I think putting it all into that frame, I think that's the, I think that's the linchpin in driving uh, policy change.